welcome to this first uh, public talk that we're looking to do at Good News for a Man. Um, this isn't the live version. The live version cut out after 12 minutes, unfortunately. And for all who came uh, to the public talk, we thank you for your presence there. But I've been asked to re-record the talk because it might be of use to a few people. So that's my intention in doing this uh, today. This is the first public talk of hopefully many where we're going to go again in January. So if you are free in January uh, and you follow the Good News for Arma uh, Facebook, please do join in and uh, come along. You'd be more than welcome. Now, our topic tonight is why bother with God? And I genuinely think that this is one of the key questions for Arma and for Ireland itself. Um, for I'm going around the doors, and I went around the doors, you may have seen me giving out invites um, for the public talk. But whenever people saw the invitation, they were quite interested. Public talk in the uh, Anakmaka Cultural Centre, sounds good. But whenever they saw the word God, then they kind of went, oh. And you could see it in people's faces. And in many senses, I do not judge. Because there are many reasons why people have decided to throw off the idea of God or don't like the idea of God. Possibly because of trauma, something massive that's happened in a life that's put them off the idea of God. What I think is the busyness of life, that's a huge factor. We're just getting on the life Monday through Friday, through Saturday, through Sunday, back to Monday again, and suddenly we're on the go and busyness of life and I don't have time for God. Bad example is a huge one in Armagh that people have seen people representing God and not in a great way. Or just wrong ideas, and I think that's one of the key ones in Armagh, that people don't actually understand who the true God of Christianity is. What I want to do in this talk is I want to go for the heart of what the Christian gospel is. I want to think about Jesus Christ in his incarnation, in his life, in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And in a sense, I want to show you the heart of Christianity and show you why you should genuinely bother with God. If you've ever seen a boat being launched, and you should YouTube one, it's quite a sight. But when, if you ever looked at the hull of it, you'll notice that it's very clean. There's nothing on it. But if you were to take that same boat a couple of months later, you would find that there would be things on the hull. And if it's not properly cleaned or attended to, that will grow and it will actually um, be detrimental to the boat itself. Barnacles and, and different bits of debris can attach themselves to the hull and it can actually become part of the vessel and do damage, can actually slow the trajectory of the, the ship down. You know, Christianity is a bit like that. That over the years, it has picked up certain things. Some have been very good traditions, and a lot of it has been really, really bad. And what I am about, and what I want to do in this talk, is get back to the original, get back to what Christianity is about. Christianity, Jesus Christ. I want to think about him tonight. Now, just in thinking about the title, Why Bother With God, I should say two preliminary things. Number one, that as you by now have gathered, I am a convinced Christian. It's maybe something that you would like to ask me about and I'd be totally up uh, for answering that question. But secondly, the title is Why Bother With God? It's not Why Bother With Church? And that is really important. And this is where I need to be delicate. These talks are not a call to join a church, but to meet God. Now, I'm not a Catholic, and I'm not a Protestant. I'm actually something that is thir a third group, but that's really hard for us to imagine, a third group of Christianity, Catholic, Protestant, what's the, what's the middle ground? It's very difficult for us to try and imagine that. BBC, a while ago, BBC Spotlight did a... Uh, a program about religion in Northern Ireland. And they interviewed this man who's a Muslim. 
and whenever he was eight years old, he came over to um, Ireland here and he was walking down Ormo Park for the first time. And two wee fellas come up to him and says, here mate, you can't like our possum. And to which he replied, well, I'm a Muslim. And they screwed up their faces and they said, but are you a Catholic Muslim or a Protestant Muslim? That's us here. It's very difficult to imagine a third way, but I need you to. Because some of you are sick to the back teeth of your tradition. You've been put off by your tradition. Now, this isn't a, this isn't a hammering of every church out there. I'm not doing that. But the bad example of Christianity, I definitely am. And what I would love to do, I would love to get back to what is true, what is the original. And if we get back to the New Testament, genuinely do that, then we bypass Catholic, we bypass Protestant, and we get back to Jesus himself. And that's why if you live in Armagh in this next year or so, hopefully you will receive one of these Gospels of Mark. And I invite you to read it because the Gospel of Mark is just a record of the life of Jesus, a historical narrative of Jesus getting back to the original of things. What would things, what would Christianity look like if there was no barnacles on the hull, if the, the hull was completely clean? What would it look like? And that's what I want to think about tonight for a few minutes. What would Christianity look like without nothing attached? Well, it would look like Jesus Christ. And so if we think about the original Christianity, why bother with it? Three reasons. First of all, Christianity and God will give you a rock for tomorrow. Now, none of us know what tomorrow will bring. None of us. Um, but I know one thing. <laughs> that life is difficult and you you might be able to empathize with this and life is full of trouble and sometimes our troubles they are definitely self-made with maybe bad decisions that we have made or selfish ambitions sometimes our troubles in life come just from living in this broken world um, sometimes our troubles are part of everyday life like sickness and betrayals and hurt and pain and tears and death. Sometimes our troubles are just evilly inspired on the other side of the world that affect us. So what's happening in the moment with Putin's evil intent and affecting our crisis of living and all of the rest. But life can be difficult. But the promise of the Bible is that in the difficulties of life that God can be and Jesus can be a rock. This is Matthew chapter 7 and it's Jesus after he has taught a, a long sermon um, in Matthew's gospel he gives this little um, bit of encouragement um, towards the end. Matthew 7 and verse 24 he says everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And so Jesus here, he says that if you build your life upon me and my teaching, if you genuinely follow me, then when the storms of life comes, it won't be shifting sand for you. It won't be unstable, but you'll have something and someone to fall back upon. Now, two things what this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we can treat Jesus like the good mechanic. I have a good mechanic in my car, or, well, in my car, but he fixes my car. And he lives out the other side of Market Hill. Now, I genuinely don't see him often. Maybe I should, maybe I should extend a bit of friendship, but I genuinely and generally only call him if my car is broken. Now, we cannot treat 
Jesus like that. That whenever things go wrong, then we can just phone up, so to speak, send up the prayers and let him and get him to fix our life. Because sometimes we just want our life fixed, but we don't want to follow Jesus. And it doesn't work that way. Jesus says, build your life upon me and I will be a rock. And Jesus says thus to follow him. The second thing that this doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that if you become a Christian or if you start to build your life upon Jesus, that the storms won't come. But what it does mean is that you will find someone stable in your life when everything seems to go to pot. When the storm just beats upon you, that there will be that stability in you. I got talking to a guy recently, um, and he agnostic, thinking about things, and he said this to me. He says, John, the difference between you and I is that whenever it gets difficult, I am by myself, but you have someone to lean on. And that is true. And that's what Christianity offers. It offers that God can be a rock in the storm and in the difficulty and in the trouble of life. The Bible will say that God is a shield. And what that means is that God will take the brunt of the trouble for us. If I was to attack you and you had a shield and the sword hits the shield, it's not that you don't feel it. But if the shield wasn't there, you'd be a lot worse. And God is there. And because God is there, then if he wasn't, our lives would be so much more worse. Imagine if God doesn't exist for a moment. What do we have in the storms of life? Well, this is the famous uh, atheist, Richard Dawkins. In his book, A River Out of Eden, he says this, that DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. This is a pretty horrific but consistent view of atheism, that if there is no God and you get cancer, it's just your genes. There's no purpose in it. There's no end to it. There's no promise of a, a life after. There's nothing like that. It just is. Get on with it. Someone in your life dies, that's just evolution. That's just what naturally happens. Get on with it. There's nothing meaningful or purposeful in it or behind it. Or there's nothing to comfort you, nothing to care. It just is. Get on with it. It's a pretty cold a view of life. And I'm so glad that the Bible does not teach that. But what it does teach is that if you follow Jesus, if you build your life upon him, take his ser teaching seriously, then you will know someone who walks with you through the difficulty of life. And what I mean by this is that Christianity is completely unique among any other religion. No other religion will say that God has come down to be one of us. But this is what Christmas is about, the incarnation of Jesus, that the divine becomes human, that Jesus becomes a man. And he lives our life that he is tired, that he thirsts, that he hungers, that he's betrayed, that he's abused. All of these things that we struggle with, all of these things that we experience in life, Jesus faced them. He faced them. And what that means is that whenever we go through life, we can go through life, if we build our life upon his teachings, we can go through life with him who knows what it is to suffer, who knows what it is to feel what we feel. And so instead of Richard Dawkins, we can know this, that Jesus cares and knows that he is present as we follow him. I think that is just such a more caring, more real, more amazing view of life. Why should we bother with God? Because he is a rock for tomorrow. He is a sure comfort who walks with us in the difficulties of life. And I just find that so comforting. Secondly, why should we bother with God? Secondly, because he is hope for the future. Now, this is probably the most serious point. Um, 
of why we should bother with God. For this reason, the Bible actually teaches that we are going to meet him. We're going to see him face to face. We're going to stand in his presence. And if we are true to the Bible, that's a really serious thing. For this reason, this is um, C.S. Lewis, and in his book, Mere Christianity, which I would really recommend, he says this, this is the fix that we're in. If the universe is not governed by an absolute goodness, then all our efforts are in the long run hopeless. So what he basically says, if there's no God, don't bother with anything. But if it is, then we are making ourselves enemies to that goodness every day and are not in the least likely to do any better tomorrow. And so our case is hopeless again. We cannot do without it. We cannot do with it. God is the only comfort. He is also the supreme terror, the thing that we most need and the thing that we most want to hide from. He is our only possible ally and we have made ourselves his enemies. And his point is this, that God out there is absolute goodness, but we're not. But we're going to meet him. And so we need him, but we want to run from him. And his point is real. And this is how he finishes the quote. Some people talk as if meeting the gaze of absolute goodness would be fun. They need to think again. They are still only playing with religion. And you see what he's saying. You're going to meet it at this absolute goodness. We are going to meet God. If the Bible is true, if Christianity is true, you're going to meet God one day. And he is good. Absolutely good pure, sinless, holy, but we're not. It's not that we can't do good, but we're not good. So we can do acts of good, and probably as I was driving up um, here today, I drove past CBS and Armagh, if you know it, and as I was coming up to, to CBS and there was a bit of a traffic jam, you know, I let someone out, that's what we do, just one night. We let one person out, you know. We don't let more than that. Maybe two if we're feeling good. Like, but generally we can do good acts, but we're not good. Not really. If, we, if we're truly honest, not that we can't do good things, but we're not good. We are selfish. We are inward. And one man used to say that we're turned in on ourselves. And that is true. And that is serious. Because what God, he demands of his heaven is absolute goodness. So how can we meet him? You might say that's a bit harsh, but not actually because there's certain things in life that we we demand absolute goodness in. So say, for example, you're going for an operation. You would demand absolute cleanness of the operating room. Because anything, any bit of dirt or infection would be detrimental to your person. Any bit of infection of selfishness and sin in heaven would be detrimental to it, would be an affront against God. And so absolute goodness, we're not good, but the Bible says that we will meet God. And so this is the fix we're in, says Lewis. And the Bible says this, that we're going to meet God, but we need to prepare to meet our God. Now this is where we fall through the gaps. And this is where we misunderstand what the Christian gospel is. And this is what I mean. So these are the things that people would generally say that is in the Christian gospel. So God has created angels and humans and animals and biological life. We would say that Jesus has come, died for our sins, rose from the dead, and there's gonna be a common judgment. And on the value of that judgment, people will go to either heaven or hell. This is the Christian teaching. But here's where the under misunderstanding happens. That is, one wee woman said it one time, says, yep, we're, we're not good, and Jesus died for our sin, but Jesus died for 99% of our sin, but we have to do our 1%. And what she meant by that was, Jesus helped us on the way, and we have to be good, pray, attend church, do all of the things uh, of all of the religious things, all of the good moral things, and then coming on a judgment day, 
God will weigh up our good deeds and our bad deeds. And if we have done enough, heaven. If we have not done enough, hell or else another place. So this is the kind of idea of Christian teaching that people think of what Christianity is. And it's like an exam. And so like we get a 70% pass and we'll get in type of thing. Now the difficulty with that view one of the difficulties, there's many difficulties, but the major difficulty is this, is that it leads to you being ruled by complete fear and guilt. And this might sound familiar to a lot of you that this is what you know of Christianity, that it's just about fear, it's just about guilt, it's just about don't you do that, or it's just about I can't believe you did that. And so you are almost bullied into acting a certain way. And maybe that's what you know Christianity to be. How do you know that you've done enough? Like that's the big thing. So Mother Teresa, for example, um, her biographer um, was asked one time, what was the one thing that struck you about Mother Teresa? And she said on her deathbed that she didn't know that she had done enough. It's a woman that's given her life. Well, whatever you think of her, she's given her life for good works. Um, but she still didn't know on her deathbed if she has done enough. I find that very sad because it is a life ruled by fear and it is a life ruled by guilt. Some of you just know this, that Christianity is rules and regulations. Say your prayers, give your money, read your Bible, take communion, and you'll be okay. Let's get back to the originals. Let's get back to what the Bible says because the Bible says something really different. The Bible says this, and I'm going to take a few of the New Testament writers and see what they say about this common judgment. For example, Jesus, the Son of God in the flesh. He says this, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me might have eternal life. Is that what it says? No, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. So this is Jesus talking about a person who's come to believe in him. And Jesus himself says that that person who's come to believe in him will not come into judgment, but has already right now eternal life. Doesn't seem to be fear or guilt there. Paul, the apostle, he says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, that word justified means declared right, made right with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice. See that word rejoice? It means have confidence in. We have confidence in the hope of glory. That's what Paul says. Paul wasn't in doubt. He wasn't ruled by fear. He wasn't ruled by guilt. What about Peter? This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he says this, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Like There's no uncertainty there. In fact, Peter says that if you believe, you will be saved. The Apostle John, quoting um, the Lord Jesus, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should be not perish, but have right now eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In his letter, John says this, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in the son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Look at the certainty that John has. Look at the certainty that Peter has, Paul has, Jesus has. And this is what Christianity truly is. So the question is, is how do we have certainty? And I think it's got to do with the cross of Christ and the resurrection. See, earlier on we thought about Jesus coming down and being incarnated, experiencing our life and is able then to help us through this life. But Jesus came down to go to Calvary's cross. 
And what happened at Calvary's cross was this. The Bible says that Jesus, Christ Jesus, died for our sins, the Bible says. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions, that he was bruised, that he was crushed for our iniquities. So the Bible says that at Calvary's cross, whenever Jesus was on the cross, that the, the sky went dark. And there God laid on Jesus all of our sin. So if I had 10 coins of my, in my hand, and these 10 coins represented all of my sins, how many of my sins did Jesus die for? Well, you would say the 10 of them. Okay, 10 away. Where's the, where's the 1% for us to do like the wee woman said? It's not there. And this is the point. This is how we can have certainty. Jesus Christ died for all of our sins, all of your sins at Calvary's cross. And he rose again to prove it. And what it means is this. Not if you work, 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 work. No. What it means is this. Notice the verses that Jesus said, Truly, truly, I said to you, whoever hears my word and believes him, believes in him. Paul, we have been justified, made right with God by faith, by believing what Jesus has done. Peter, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. So if a person realizes, boy, I have sinned, I am not good, but I am going to meet absolute goodness. You realize the weight of your sins, but then you realize that Jesus has stood in your place and bore your sins and rose again to prove it. And if you call, if you ask God to save you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then what happens in that moment? You're saved. I became a Christian whenever I was 19. And there was no lights or sounds or any of that kind of stuff. It was simply by my bedside. And it was about half 11 at night. And I, do, I can't even remember what I prayed. But I know in those moments that I realized that I had sinned. But yet I would meet God. And it did fill me with somewhat of a fear. And it should, if we're honest. But I realized what Jesus had done. That he died in my place for me. And that he rose again. And if he was offering me a gift. And it was like it was, he was offering me salvation. And I simply called. And I said, Lord, I have I've sinned or something like that. But I'm, I'm trusting in you. I can't earn this, Lord, but you have given this to me. And in that moment, that moment, I got up off my knees, absolutely assured that I would never come into judgment. And every day since that, I know for sure that I will never come into judgment. Why? Why? Because Jesus was judged in my place. Jesus took my place and he rose again to prove it. And see, it's the difference between guilt and fear. Now I live every day with hope and love. You know, I still read my Bible, try to read my Bible every day. I don't do it because I have to. I don't do it to earn my salvation. I have salvation and I want to get to know God more. I pray every day, not because I have to to earn my salvation, but because I want to thank God for what he has done. And I realize more and more that I need his help. And so I pray. I go to church a couple of times a week, not because I'm good. <laughs> I'm not. And not because I have to but because I want to know about this God who has done so much for me. I still try to, to feed the poor. Why? Because, not because I have to, I'm not earning anything by it, but because it's what God has told us to do and I want to show him that I love him. And this totally transforms the whole idea of Christianity from something that you have to drudgery do in order to earn your salvation to something that you delight to do because you have salvation. And this is what Christianity looks like without the, with the hull completely clean. When you go back to the New Testament and you cut through everything, you see that salvation is a gift. And God offers us a gift. And listen, not only a rock for tomorrow, but a genuine and sure hope 
for the future. God loves you. God wants you to, to know him. God wants you to be safe on that day. God doesn't genuinely want to, to, to send anybody to a lost eternity. He doesn't. He wants the world to be saved. He wants you to be saved. So much so that he sent his son. And Jesus took your place, my place, so that God could come to know us. And it's good news. It's gospel. That's what gospel means. So he is a rock for tomorrow. He is hope for the future. But thirdly and quickly, why should you bother with God? Because he is satisfaction for now. If you've watched any of the Good News for my videos, you should watch the wee intro. And I purposely used um, the song, U2 song, uh, you know, where Bono sings, um, we still haven't found what we're looking for. Because I think that is where genuinely a lot of our ma is. Not in our good moments when we're with people and we're laughing and all the rest, but in our moments when we're maybe on our own. In our moments when we genuinely are off Facebook and off Twitter and on, off Instagram and off YouTube, and we genuinely sit in the quietness and we think, genuinely think, we know that there's something gaping. We know that we have this distinct emptiness. The Bible says this in, in Colossians. It's talking about Jesus. And in verse 16 of Colossians 1, it says this. It says, For in him all things were created. In heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and for him. And it's a verse teaching us that, that Jesus is the creator of the universe. Now that means something. And I should say that all of us will know intuitively that we are created. We didn't create ourselves. We know we're created. But if there is a creator, what does that mean? So this is what these three wee words are important, and that's what I've highlighted on the screen. This universe was created in Jesus. That means that he thought the whole thing up. This universe was created through Jesus. That means that he has the power to do it. But the universe was created for him. And that's what I want to emphasize. Because this is where genuine satisfaction in life comes. Whenever you come into line with your creator, you will realize the purpose of life and your purpose of life. What I mean is this, for my 30th birthday, uh, my wife took me fishing, which is great. I don't really get to fly fish much, but uh, fly fishing. And um, went to this wee lake out, um, out the other side of Moira, I think it was actually. And I was standing at the side of the lake and I was flying and I wasn't catching much, much and I kind of started imagining a couple of fish under the surface. So let's take, for example, um, Trevor. Trevor the Trout, you know, swimming around, um, enjoying the water. But then he bumps into Sammy the Salmon. I'm going somewhere with this part. Um, and the both of them have a conversation. And Trevor says, Sammy, mate, do you, ever, do you ever get sick of the water? Like being wet and dark down here and it's cold always and slime. Do you ever not get sick of the water? And Sammy says, Oh, I've never thought about it, but Trevor says, have you ever want to kick a football? Like, you know, and Trevor says, you know what I'm going to do, Sammy? I'm going to get up on that bank and I am going to go for the football. I'm going to kick a football. And Sammy says, don't do it, Trevor. Don't do it. And Trevor bullies on past him and flops up onto the bank. And what happens? Well, he, he dies. He dies because he's a fish. <laughs> and the fish was made for the water. And in the water is genuinely where Trevor thrived. It's where life had its purpose and meaning for Trevor because he was made for the water. Can I just say that you are made to live under God. And if you were to come and to live your life under God, you would find purpose and meaning in your life. 
In the book of Genesis, in chapter 4, you meet a man called Cain. And the long and short of his story is this. Is that God had made him to be a pretty good farmer. It's how he had purpose in life. It's how he found meaning. He tilled the soil, the Bible says. And whenever it came to giving his offering back to God, giving thanks back to God for how he had made him, Cain came up short. So God challenged him about this. And Cain did an unspeakable act. God then, after this unspeakable act, comes to Cain and he lays a punishment upon him as a consequence for what he had done. And Cain's punishment was this. Number one, that he would be a wanderer. Nothing stable in his life. And more than that, that his purpose in life the tilling of the soil, the farming, would actually become a lot more difficult, a lot harder. And Cain comes to a point, and this is what he says. It's almost like there's tears running down his face, and he says, Lord, this is too hard for me. Here's a guy who decided to go his own way, not live for God, not live under God, and what he does as he ends his life, or goes into life, completely unstable, a wanderer. But not only that, like finding life incredibly difficult. Not knowing what his purpose is. Wandering around, but finding life incredibly difficult. And as I think about that story of a man walked away from God and struggled in life, no purpose, no foundation, I think of many in our man. And you might be watching this. And for nights, maybe you have cried yourself to sleep, that your pillow's wet at nights because you have looked up to heaven and you said, God, this is too hard for me. Life is just so difficult for me, Lord. I have no purpose, I have no direction. And maybe you've just walked away from God. You know, I resonate with this guy, Cain, because I didn't become a Christian until I was 19. And I walked away from God. And I did everything that I could to fill my life with pleasure that is out there. Until it came to the point where I realized that if I am created, if there is a creator who has thought me up in him, who has powerfully made everything about this universe through him, then the best thing that I could ever do is to genuinely live for him. And I will tell you right now that in becoming a Christian at 19, all my problems did not go away. <laughs> I'll right now. But at that moment, I not only found forgiveness of my sins and a sure home in heaven, but I genuinely found purpose in life, my reason for being here. And that gives such satisfaction to the soul. And my point for you listening is this. Why bother with God? Well, if you follow him, you will genuinely find a rock. If you trust him, you will genuinely find salvation. And if you submit to him, you will genuinely find your life. What do I mean? Why bother with God? He is a rock for tomorrow. He is hope for the future. And he is satisfaction 